number of times, number of times during our discussions, uh, mentioned stars, whether it was maybe Yefet Ben Eli or Abu Faraj. Um, but I noticed that that definitely what is, I mean, this in Hebrew in Israel we have this program Kochav Nolad, which I assume everybody else has a different version. But uh, American Idol. American Idol. It doesn't work. Doesn't work as well. Does it? <laughs> But I paid attention that, that certainly one of the stars of the workshop in terms of citations by other talk by other speakers is Jeffrey Khan of Cambridge University. And one thing which is uh, uh, different that, that distinguishes Jeffrey from a lot of the people who were researchers in charism is that he fulfilled at least the rabbinic um, mandate of Emidu Tamidim Harbet that uh, we have in this room quite a number of his students and started, founded a really a, a school of, uh, of study of Karaite grammar from the earliest times in the ninth century in Persia until the latest, uh, I don't know, the Eastern European Karaite grammars, but certainly in the Judeo-Arabic period. And uh, as someone who doesn't understand very much from grammar and uh, from language, I remember over 20 years ago, I mentioned that a conference was in Paris that I think only Yuan and Chagai, this group, was there. I remember after his talk, saying it was about the Gaia, and saying, this is so boring, but it's so interesting. <laughs> in any event, I'm very happy that he came and was participating and, that with, and his students, and Jeffrey would talk about early traditions of Karaite grammar. Well, thank you very much, Danny, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and again, thank you very much for all the, you know, the hospitality, and it is a great pleasure to be surrounded by lots of friends and students as well. And second generation students. Good. And uh, we've, um, we've heard quite a lot about grammar, I think, uh, in this workshop from the very first lecture onwards, um, and uh, we've, uh, so far though, um, the name that's been, that's been coming up quite a lot is, is that of Abul Faraj Herun in various contexts. I mean, first with Marichel and Aaron and Miriam uh, Goldstein and some other contexts. And of course, uh, Abul Faraj Herun was one of the great, uh, one of the key figures in uh, 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 Arabic grammatical, um, in, sorry, in the Karaite gr grammatical tradition. But um, today I'm going to concentrate on another key figure and the uh, surrounding tradition, uh, and that is um, Yusuf ibn Nuh, who um, was the predecessor of uh, Abu Faraj uh, and represents, uh, as I want to present here, uh, a very different uh, approach to grammatical thought. Uh, indeed, I mean, we'll see that Abu Faraj was the According to Ibn al Hiti, I mean, Abu Faraj was the pupil of Ibn Nuh, though it doesn't really show from the, the works. If you read uh, Abu Faraj, he, he doesn't seem to really know much about the uh, tradition uh, of uh, Ibn Nuh at all. So one well, wonders what kind of pupil he was, actually. But, um, less, less successful than you would be. <laughs> okay, so Yusuf Ibn Nuh's work is datable to the second half of the 10th century, the surviving works that are explicitly attributed to him in the colophons have the form of biblical commentaries. These include colophons, these, these include commentaries that are primarily exegetical in nature, a commentary that is concerned primarily with translation and a grammatical commentary. Ibn Nuh was heir to a tradition of Hebrew grammar that had developed among the Karaites of Iraq and Iran. This was brought to Jerusalem in the migrations of Karaites from the east during the 10th century. Ibn Nuh himself was an immigrant from Iraq. I shall refer to this grammatical tradition as the early Karaite tradition of Hebrew grammatical thought. Abu Farish Harun continued some of the elements of this tradition, but was innovative in many ways, both in method and in content. During most of his adult life, Abu, Abu Ya'qub Yusuf ibn Nuh, known in Hebrew as Yosef ben Noach, resided in Palestine. According to Ibn al-Hiti, who wrote a chronicle of Karaite scholars, he had a college 
Darlil Ilm in Jerusalem, which appears to have been established around the end of the 10th century. One Hebrew grammatical text that is attributed to Yusuf ibn Nuh is extant. This work is referred to in the colophons either simply as the Dikduk or as Nukat Dikduk, points of grammar. In what follows, I shall refer to it by its shorter title. It is written in Arabic, that is to say, manuscripts are written in Hebrew script most usually, so Judah Arabic, though much of the technical terminology is Hebrew. Abu Yaqub Yusuf ibn Nuh is likely to be identical with Abu Yaqub Yusuf ibn Bakhtaway, or Bakhtawi, who is mentioned in some sources. Bakhtaway may have been the Iranian equivalent of the name Nuh or Noah. Persian Bakht, fortune, prosperity, this may be the, the etymology. Yusuf ibn Bakhtaway is stated in the sources to have been a grammarian who composed a book called Ad Dikduk. And there are references to the Khatser, or the compound of Ibn Bakhtaway, which is likely to be identical with Ibn Nuh's <coughs> college, referred to by, by Ibn al Hiti by the corresponding Arabic term Dar. Remember, Dar in the Middle Ages meant an enclosure, not, not like a house as we know it. Ibn Bakhtaway is described as the Babylonian and teacher of the diaspora, Mu'allim al Jalia which indicates that his career had begun in Iraq. The Dikduk of Ibn Nuh is not a systematically arranged description of the Hebrew language, with the various aspects of grammar presented in separate chapters, but rather a series of grammatical notes on the Bible, together with sporadic exegetical comments. Occasionally a general principle of grammar is discussed, but in most cases grammatical concepts are not explained, and their sense must be inferred from the context in which they are used. The work covers the entire Bible, selecting words and phrases that are deemed to require elucidation <coughs> and analysis. It consists of a series of entries headed by a phrase from a biblical verse that constitutes the subject of the comment. <coughs> the entries are arranged according to the order of verses in the biblical text. By no means all verses, however, are commented upon. The work was clearly intended to be used as an aid to the reading of the Bible. It does not offer instruction on the rudiments of Hebrew grammar, but rather concentrates on points that Ibn Nuh believed may be problematic for the reader or concerning which there was controversy. The main concern of the Dikduk is the analysis and explanation of word structure. On various occasions, aspects of phonology and also the syntactic and rhetorical structure of a verse are taken into account, but this is generally done as a means of elucidating the form of a word. The pronunciation of the letters and vowels or syntactic structures are rarely, if ever, the primary focus of attention. There is no systematic treatment of syntax or rhetorical structures. The Dikduk, therefore, is not a comprehensive gram of Hebrew either in its arrangement or in its content. It concentrates on what are regarded as problematic grammatical issues. This is reflected in the title of the work, Nukat Dikduk, which is found in one manuscript. The Arabic term Nukat can have the sense of questions, difficult points, or notes, ex notes explaining difficulties. These problematic issues are generally referred to as Masail, the singular mas'ala, a question. Uh, when, when, when they occur in certain rubrics in, within the manuscripts. So there's, there's the rubric saying mas'al. In, in his analysis of word structure, Ibn Nuh attempted to find consistent rules governing the formation of words. The ultimate purpose of his grammatical activity was the application of grammatical analysis in order to elucidate the precise meaning of the biblical text and to, dem and to demonstrate that there was nothing random or inconsistent about the language of the Bible. Differences in forms must be explained by positing differences in the process of derivation. The aim was to show that the language had a completely rational basis in its structure and in its structure, and differences in structure were in principle, in principle 
rationally motivated and intended to convey differences in meaning. In the system of derivational morphology that is presented by Ibn Nuh, most inflected verbal forms are derived from an imperative base form. The imperative base is not an abstraction, but is a real linguistic form. In some cases, the imperative form that is positive as the base of an inflected verb does not actually occur in the language. For example, the imperative base of the form natanu, we gave, is said to be neton, not tet. The imperative base of tihalach in Psalm 73.9 is said to be haloch, not lech. The imperative base of biksha, without a dagish in the kof, is said to be bakshe, not bakesh. The motivation for positing an imperative base such as bakshe is to present the derivation of the form biksha without dagesh in the kof as fully regular and not an anomalous inflection of the imperative base bakesh with a dagesh. The result of this process was that Ibn Nuh extended the language beyond what is found in the extant corpus of the Bible. The new forms that were postulated in this way were not intended to be used for the writing of creative literature. Indeed, no Karaite author has been found who used these postulated forms in a creative Hebrew text. The purpose of the expansion of the language was rather to clarify and explain the biblical Hebrew language rationally. In a few cases, the base of a form that has has the appearance of a verb, is a noun. Ibn Nuh explains small differences in some forms by proposing that one form is derived from an imperative, whereas the other is derived from a noun. In the class of verbs which we refer to as final geminates, that is to say, ein, ein verbs, there is a variation, for example, in the position of stress in the past forms. We find, for example, in Job 9.25, kalu, but in Habakkuk 1.8, Vekalu. According to Ibn Nuh, this is not an arbitrary variation, but rather the forms with the penultimate stress, such as Kalu, are derived from a noun base, whereas the forms with final stress have an imperative base. Differences in form also had significance on the level of meaning. The distinction in the types of base of forms such as Kalu and Kalu, for example, should be reflected in their Arabic translation, which he refers to as tafsir, one being translated with a nominal adjective form in Arabic and one by a verbal form. Another dimension of structural variation that Ibn Nuh believed should be taken into account when interpreting the text was the, t was the distinction between pausal and context forms. The use of a pausal form of a word was in interpreted as having the purpose of performing a particular function on the level of meaning, namely the expression of some kind of semantic disjunction. In many cases, for example, a pausal form is said to mark the boundary be between a statement and, and, and an elaborative comment that supplies the reason or justification for what proceeds. In conformity with this principle, Psalm 93.1, Adonai Malach Geut Lavesh, in which they formed Malach as a pausal form, is interpreted as having the sense of the Lord has become king for he is clothed in majesty. I.e., what shows his kinship is the fact that he is clothed in majesty. In other words, the pausal form forms a semantic disjunction and what follows is said to be an elaboration of what proceeds. So these are the kind of things which uh, Ibn Nuf was, was focusing on. A similar concern with demonstrating the rationale behind the structure of the language of the Hebrew Bible on the level of discourse interconnectivity is exhibited by Ibn Nuf in an exegetical commentary on the Pentateuch, which has come down to us in an adaptation made by his pupil, Abu Farish Harun. In this commentary, which has recently been studied in detail by Miriam Goldstein, uh, there are numerous observations regarding the function of discourse structure, especially regarding the ordering of verses. This concern for demonstrating the rationale of compositional structure is indeed 
found in the works of other Karaite exegetes of the period. The Diktuk of Ibn Nuh is the earliest extant text that can be identified with certainty as a Karaite grammatical work attributed to a specific author. Ibn Nuh, however, was certainly not the earliest Karaite grammarian. Other Karaite scholars of his generation wrote grammatical works. Judah Hadassi, for example, refers to a grammar book of Sahel ben Matzliach. A number of grammatical concepts of the early Karaite grammatical edition are found in the Bible commentaries of Yefet ben ben Eli and the lexicographical work of David ben Abraham al-Fazi. Ibn Nuh himself refers to other anonymous scholars, or lemaire, of grammar. Indeed, some anonymous Karaite Bible commentaries that are extant contain grammatical concepts relating to the early Karaite tradition, such as a commentary on Hosea that has been reconstructed from Geniza fragments by the late Friedrich Nissen. Some of the grammarians mentioned by Ibn Nuh are referred to as deceased, Abu Fayyar Sharun attributes some grammatical concepts to the teachings of earlier Karaite grammarians in Iraq. The traditions of this earlier Iraqi school described by Abu Faraj correspond closely to what we find in Ibn Nuh's Ibn Nuh, Dikduk. Ibn Nuh was an immigrant to Palestine from Iraq, where he was, it seems, a pupil of the Iraqi circle of Karaite grammarians. According to a passage in one anonymous medieval Karaite source, the, the, the discipline of grammar began in Isfahan. The Karaite al qasani writing in the first half of the 10th century, refers to Hebrew grammarians from Isfahan to Star and Bosra. This indicates that already during the time of Sa'ad Yaga'on, Karaite schools of grammar were well developed in Iran. The teachings of the early Karaite grammarians of Iran are also referred to in an anonymous Karaite grammatical text that was written in the 11th century. These are referred to in the past tense, which implies that they were active at a period that predated that of the author. Some fragments of Hebrew grammatical texts that are written in Judeo-Persian have indeed been preserved in the Cairo Geniza. These include fragments of a text that clearly belongs to the early Karaite tradition of grammar. This text is a grammatical commentary on the Bible that is very close both in format and content to the Dikduk of Ibn Nuh. The theory of grammar is virtually identical to that of the Dikduk. The derivative base of verbs is said to be imperative forms. It is likely to be a product of the early Iranian schools of Karaite grammar, which appear also to have been the ultimate source of the grammatical tradition that is reflected in Ibn Nuh's Dikdu. A further source demonstrating the Iranian background of the early Karaite grammatical tradition is a Judeo-Persian commentary on Ezekiel that was published recently by Tamar Gindin. This text, although primarily exegetical in nature, contains several grammatical comments that exhibit a grammatical terminology and theory and a style of presentation that conform to what is found in Ibn Nuh's Dikduk. According to a statement by Abul Farah Sherun, the practice of deriving verbal inflections from the imperative, which was the hallmark of the early Karaite grammatical tradition, was also followed by the Kufan school of Arabic grammar. It is not possible, however, to identify such a practice in the extant Arabic grammatical literature, and it is not at all clear that it is a concept that is borrowed from Arabic grammatical thought. The concept may indeed reflect the Iranian background of the Karaite tradition, in that in Middle and New Persian, the imperative form has a clearer structural relationship to both the present and past forms of the verb than in Hebrew and Arabic. In New Persian, for example, kardan, to do, uh, we have the imperative form kar, do, mikar, by adding a prefix to form the present, and kard, by adding an element on the imperative base. Uh, so there's a much more transparent relationship between the imperative and the other derivative forms of the verb than in Hebrew, than in saying sort of shmor, yishmor, but shamar, which has, seems to have no clear relation, the past Hebrew form having no clear relationship with the imperative. <coughs> the Hebrew... The Hebrew term dikduk 
is found in sources predating the rise of Hebrew grammatical thought. In, in rabbinic literature, the verbal form dikdek is used in the sense of attention to fine details of pronunciation and also with the meaning of investigating thoroughly the content of scripture. The verbal noun dikduk is used, often used in rabbinic literature in the sense of the details that are revealed by careful investigation. For example, the dikduke ha-Torah, minute details of biblical exposition. Among the texts relating to the activities of the Masoretes, the term is used in the title of the most famous collection of Masoretic rules, the Dikduke HaTa'amim, compiled by Aharon ben Asher. This refers to the subtle details of the use of accents in scripture. The author assumes that the general rules are known and focuses on the fine points and the, ex and the exceptions to the general principles. The title of Ibn Nuh's work, the of Ibn Nuh's work, the Dikduk, seems to have retained the sense of investigating the fine points of scripture and did not denote simply investigation of the language. The discipline of Dikduk as reflected in Ibn Nuh's work um, concentrated on selected details of the analysis of scripture. It was concerned mainly with the details that were judged to be problematic and in need of particular attention, which are generally referred to as Masail, questions or issues. Ibn Nuh assumed that the general rules of the language were already known to his audience. When discussing such Masail, Ibn Nuh frequently cited various alternative opinions. Some of these may have reflected the differing opinions of scholars who were active in the Karaite grammatical circles in the 10th century. It is likely, however, that in most cases the primary purpose of the proposal of such alternative is pedagogical in that it was a method of inviting the reader or the hearer to explore a variety of possibilities without them being necessarily attributable to any particular scholar. It encouraged inquiry and engagement rather than passive acceptance of authority. Indeed, the text of Ibn Nuh's work appears to be closely associated with the oral teaching of grammar in the schoolroom rather than drawing on a preceding written source. In the early Karaite tradition, therefore, Dik Duke was a method of investigating scripture by the study of the subtle details of its language. The purpose of this investigation was both to establish the fine details of its meaning and also to demonstrate that the language conformed to a logical system. The discipline of Dik Duke, as exhibited by the work of Ibn Nuh, was closely associated with the activity of the Masoretes, who applied themselves to the study of the details of the reading tradition and written transmission of the biblical text. A central feature of Ibn Nuh's method of presentation is the explanation as to why a word has one particular form rather than another. This often involves comparing closely related forms that differ from the form that is under investigation only in small details. The issue that is addressed is why these fine distinctions in form exist. This may be compared to the practice of the Masoretes to, to collate words that were similar in form but differed only in details. This was a central feature of the Masoretic method and lists, accord, uh, and lists recording these collations are found throughout the Masoretic notes that were attached to Bible codices. The purpose of this was to draw attention to fine details of form to ensure that they were preserved in the transmission of scripture. Collations of two closely related forms of a word were also compiled, compiled in independent Masoretic treatises, such as Ochla ve Ochla. By the 10th century, the Masoretes also compiled, compiled treatises that formulated rules for the occurrence of some of these fine distinctions in form with regard to vowels and accents. The most famous work of this kind is the Dictukea Taumim, the rules of the details of the accents, which was compiled, compiled in the first half of the 10th century by Aharon ben Asher. As remarked, the Dik Duke of Ibn Nuh was concerned principally with morphology. It was intended, it seems, to complement such treatises as Dik Duke Ta'amim, the exclusive concern of which was pronunciation and accents. This complementary relationship between the Masora and grammar which characterizes the early Karaite grammatical tradition, 
contrast with the scope of the grammatical work composed by Sa'adi Ga'on in the 10th century. After, after leaving Egypt, Sa'adi spent a few years in Tiberias, studying among the Masoretes. According to Dotan, he composed his grammar book, Kitab Fasih Lughat al Ibraniyin, while he was in Tiberias during the second decade of the 10th century. Until the Dik Duke of Ibn Nuh, uh, sorry, unlike the Dik, the, the Dik Duke of Ibn Nuh, the grammatical work of Sa'adia does not complement the work of the Masoretes, but rather incorporates numerous elements from it. The surviving sections of the work include not only treatments of grammatical inflection and word structure, but also several chapters relating to the Tiberian reading tradition. The material for some of these has clearly been incorporated from the Masoretic tradition, and direct parallels can be found in the extant Masoretic treatises, such as Dikdukea Ta'amim. Sa'adia refers to the accents on various occasions. Dotan, indeed, it suggests that one of the missing chapters may have been concerned specifically with accents. We may say that Sa'adia's grammar book is not a product of collaboration with the Masoretes or a complementary expansion of the scope of Masoretic teaching, as is the, as is the case with the Dik Duke of Ibn Nuh, but rather was intended as standing separate from the Masoretic tradition. The grammatical activity denoted by the term Dik Duke in the early Karak tradition, therefore, was closely associated with the work of the Tiberian Masoretes. This is further shown by an early text published by Aloni that contains a list of technical terms for the various aspects of biblical study. These are described in the text as Dik Duke Hamikra, which has the sense of the fine points of scripture established by detailed investigation. The list includes Masoretic, grammatical and hermeneutical terms. These correspond closely to the terminology and concepts of Ibn Nuh's Dik Duk. The range of the topics of analysis denoted by the terms also parallels the scope of analysis that is found in the Dik Duk, though, as we have remarked, the focus of the Dik Duk is more on the grammatical and hermeneutical aspects than on the Masoretic. It is more accurate to say that the Masoretic works and Ibn Nuh's Dik Duk combined cover the range of topics contained in the list. The Masora and the grammatical work of Ibn Nuh complement each other to establish the Dik Duke Hamikra. This list was not intended primarily as a foundation for the study of grammar per se, but rather as a methodology for establishing the correct interpretation of scripture. Aloni, in his edition of this list of technical terms, claimed that it was, a, it, that it, it was of Karaite background. One should be cautious, however, of being too categorical on this issue. Certain details of its content suggest that it was composed in the early Islamic period. It would therefore come from a period when Karaism was in its embryonic stages of development. The main evidence that Aloni cites for its being a Karaite work is the reference to the text in the text to the Ba'aleha Mikra, the Masters of Bible Study. This term was used in some texts in the Middle Ages to, to designate Karaites. It is found, however, already in rabbinic literature in the sense of those who study only the Bible and not the Mishnah or Gemara. It should be uh, noted, moreover, that in Masoretic texts it is sometimes used as an epithet of the Masoretes, who were professionally occupied with investigation of the Bible. The contents of the list were incorporated by a number of later authors into their works. These included not only Karaites, but also Rabbanites, such as Dunash ben Labrad. The fact that some of the grammatical terms found in Ibn Nuh's Dik Duka Hebrew is significant for the dating of the origins of the Karaite grammatical tradition. The list of Dik the list of Dik Dukea Mikra is entirely in Hebrew. This is in conformity with the use of Hebrew in Masoretic works before the 10th century. The Hebrew technical terms of uh, Ibn Nuh's Dik Duk would, would, would uh, seem to be vestiges from this early period. Some of this Hebrew terminology can in fact be traced to rabbinic texts. It is clear, however, that the Karaite grammatical tradition also took over elements from Arabic grammatical thought. The Dik Duk of Ibn Nuh contains some Arabic technical terms. Moreover, many of the Hebrew terms that are found in the list of Dik Duk and Mikra and also in Ibn Nuh's Dik Duk, appear to be calques of Arabic terminology. Rafi Talmon has shown that some of the Arabic terms that are 
that, that uh, correspond to the Hebrew of the list of Dikduke and Mikra are found in the earliest layers of the tradition of Arabic grammar and Quranic exegesis in the 8th and 9th centuries. This early tradition differed from the tradition based on the teachings of Sibawe, which became the mainstream school in Arabic gr grammar after the 9th century. It is relevant to note that Arabic grammatical thought in its earliest stages was closely associated with Quranic exegesis and only later became a distinct discipline. This would parallel the association between grammar and exegesis that is reflected by the Dikduke Mikra list and also the fact that the Dikduke of Ibn Uq has the structure of a biblical commentary rather than a systematic grammar. The Dikduke Amikra list and the Masoretic treatises such as Dikduke Ta'amim belong to the Tiberian Masoretic tradition. How are we to reconcile the proposed close relationship of the early Karaite grammatical tradition to, to, the, um, to the Tiberian Masora with the proposal that the Karaite grammatical tradition had its roots in the East, in Iraq and Iran? The explanation is doubtless that the Tiberian Masoretic tradition was not restricted to a local diffusion, but rather was regarded as a prestigious tradition by Jewish scholars, Rabbanite and Karaite, throughout the Near East. The Karaite al turkiseni writing in the first half of the 10th century in Iraq, explicitly states the superiority of the Tiberian tradition. There are references in medieval sources to the fact that scholars from Tiberias travelled long distances to teach the Tiberian tradition. Moreover, scholars from the eastern communities of Iraq and Iran came into contact with the Tiberian Masoretes by migration to Palestine. This applied to numerous Karaites, including Yusuf ibn Nuh himself. It is clear from the names of scribes active in the circle of the Tiberian Masoretes that some were of Iranian origin. This applies, for example, to the scribe Said ibn Farjoy, who clearly has a Middle Iranian name. It is also relevant to note that the Masoretic material in early Tiberian Bible codices contains numerous elements originating in the Babylonian Masora, <coughs> as has been shown by Yosef Offer in his book on the Babylonian Masora. This can be explained as a reflection of the migration of Masoretes from east to west. Furthermore, some early Tiberian Masoretic manuscripts contain words with Babylonian vocalization in their Masoretic codices. The colophons of the early Tiberian Masoretic Bible codices indicate that many of them came into the possession of Karaite communities. Some studies have shown that the Masoretic notes in some Tiberian Bible codices, including the, the Aleppo Codex, contain some elements that appear to reflect Karaite, Karaite rather than Rabbanite theology or Halakha. For example, um, the, a recent article by Raphael Zer and Sfunot argued that some of the Masoretic notes in the Aleppo Codex seem to reflect a Karaite uh, theology about the transmission of the mitzvot. Does this mean that the whole circle of Tiberian Masoretes were Karaites? This would, in principle, neatly explain why the early Karaite grammatical tradition complemented the Masoretic treatises, whereas the grammar of Saadia was an independent work. There are several problems, however, with such a simple assessment. The medieval sources refer to several generations of Masoretes, some of them belonging to the, the same family. They indicate that the family of the famous Masoret Aharon ben Asher had been involved in Masoretic activities over five generations. Aharon ben Asher lived in the 10th century, and so Asher the Elder, who is stated to be the great-great-grandfather of Aharon, is likely to have lived in the second half of the 8th century, before the emergence of Karaism on the historical scene. Some of the Masoretes, furthermore, were closely associate, associated with the Rabbanite Jewish authorities. For example, there is a Masoret known as Pinchas Rosh Yeshiva, Pinchas, the head of the academy, that is to say the Rabbanite academy, who lived in the 9th century. The Yeshiva or academy was a central body of Rabbanite Judaism, um, the body of Rabbanite Jewish communal authority in Palestine. As remarked already, the term Ba'aleha Mikra, the Masters of Bible Study, which is used 
to designate both Karaite and Masoretes in the medieval sources is found already in rabbinic literature in the sense of those who study only the Bible are not the Mishnah or Gemara. Some close parallels to the format and phraseology of the Masoretic notes can in fact be found in Midrasic literature composed before the Islamic period. All this suggests that Karaite scholars joined forces with an, with an, an existing stream of tradition of Bible scholarship in Rabbanite Judaism, enhancing it and developing it further by finding the rational basis of minor differences or difficult words, uh, difficult forms of words. A further point that should be made is that Ibn Nuh and Karaite grammarians of the 10th century and 11th century in general were concerned with the reading tradition, the Karay, reflected by the Tiberian vocalization signs, and showed little concern for the orthography of the written text, the Kativ. The reading tradition was the basis of all of Ibn Nuh's grammatical analyses. al Qasani, in his discussions of the basis of authority for the Hebrew Bible, contended that the ultimate author authoritative source was the reading tradition of the people of Palestine, by which he meant Tiberius, rather than the written tradition, the written form of the text with orthographic inconsistencies. One of his justifications was that, was that the reading tradition had been transmitted by the whole community, the Ummah, since the time of the prophets, whereas the, whereas the written orthography had been transmitted on the authority of small circles of scribes, which is, which is therefore <coughs> more liable to corruption or willful change. Indeed, as is well known, the Karaites have left many Bible manuscripts from the Middle Ages that represent the Karay of, Ty of, Tiberian Masoretic, of the Tiberian Masoretic text in Arabic transcription. These can be understood most easily as a reflection of the priority that the Karaites gave to the reading tradition. A few fragmentary texts are extant that are closely associated with Ibn Nuh's Dikduk and belong to the early Karaite grammatical tradition. We have already mentioned a Judeo-Persian grammatical commentary which parallels the Dikduk both in grammatical theory and in structure. In addition to this, we have large fragments of an early Karaite grammatical text that is not in the form of a biblical commentary but rather is a systematic classification of the morphological patterns of biblical Hebrew verbs and nouns. This classification represents the core grammatical thought that developed within the early Karaite discipline of Dikduk. The text is attributed to a certain Sa'id. It is likely that this should be identified with the grammarian Sa'id Shiran, who was a pupil of Ibn Nuh. The text exhibits many parallels with the grammatical work of Ibn Nuh in its grammatical theory, terminology and argumentation. It consists of a series of chapters, each of which is devoted to verbs with imperative bases of one particular pattern. A full inventory is given of the verbs in each category, problematic issues are discussed, and a complete paradigm of a representative verb is presented. In its overall structure, the treatise differs from Ibn Nuh's Dikduk, which, as we have seen, consists of grammatical notes on the Bible arranged in the order of the biblical verses. It nevertheless exhibits a similarity to the Dikduk in its method of discussing problematic issues. As is the case in the Dikduk, these discussions frequently offer a variety of different opinions concerning the derivation of a form. The fact that such attention is given to Masail indicates that the work was not intended as an elementary grammar of Hebrew, a distinct feature of the text is the presentation of paradigms of verbs contained, containing the various inflections. Full paradigms are given even of verbs that are of quite unique occurrence and appear prima facie to be anomalous, with all of their inflections being recovered by analogy. This applies, for example, to the unusual prefix conjugation form yish, yishputu in Exodus 18.26, which is not interpreted as an irregular variant form of the normal third plural prefix conjugation, yishpatu, but rather part of a completely separate paradigm, which has the imperative form, shifute, and the 
the prefix conjugation yishpu te and the um, suffix conjugation shufu titi, etc. Such apparently exceptional and anomalous forms are thereby shown to be entirely regular uh, when the full potential system of the language is reconstructed. As remarked already, elements of the early Karaite grammatical tradition are found also in Karaite exegetical and lexicographical texts that are roughly contemporary with the activity of Ibn Nuh, such as the works of Yefet ben Ali and David ben Abraham al-Fazi. The comparison of Ibn Nuh's grammatical and exegetical comments with these other medieval Karaite works reveals numerous parallels, but also a significant number of differences. Although many of the texts contain grammatical ana analyses that follow the same theoretical system as that of Ibn Nuh, it is clear that the authors of the texts are not dependent on Ibn Nuh's dikduk. This is shown by the fact that their analyses are sometimes different from the ones presented by Ibn Nuh. Furthermore, the comparative texts such as Yefet ben Eli's commentaries contain grammatical analyses of Hebrew words that are not included in the dikduk of Ibn Nuh. Although Ibn Nuh's dikduk has come down to us as the major surviving text of early grammatical tradition, it was clearly not regarded as an authoritative standard source. A major change in the development of the Karaite grammatical, uh, of Karaite grammatical activities took place with the works of Abu Faraj Herun ibn Faraj, who was active in Jerusalem in the first half of the 11th century. According to the chronicler <coughs> Ibn al-Hiti, he was the student of Yusuf ibn Nuh and was attached to the Karaite College in Jerusalem. After the death of ibn Nuh, Abu Faraj took over the leadership of the college. Abu Faraj Herun wrote several Arabic works on the Hebrew language. The largest of these is the comprehensive work on, the Hebrew, on, on Hebrew morphology and syntax, consisting of eight parts. The al kitab Mushtamal, al al asul wal fasul fil lughat al as we heard about um, earlier on in this workshop, uh, which was completed in 1026. This consisted of eight parts which, have originally been, which may have originally been produced as separate books. He composed a shorter version of the work called al kitab al-Kafi, Filogat al the sufficient book on the Hebrew language, as we've also heard earlier on. The earliest known manuscript of this work, the al kitab al-Kafi, has a colophon dated to 1037. al kitab al-Kafi had a much wider circulation than al kitab al-Mushtamil, uh, judging by the number of extant manuscripts contain, containing the work. We have a few fragments of a text that appears to be a, an epitome of al kitab al so we have three degrees of shortening of the work, what, well, two degrees of shortening of the work. A further work of Abu Farah Sharun, which has survived in various manuscript fragments, is an introductory treatise on, grammat on grammar called Kitab al-Madkhal il al-Ilm al-Dikduk fi Turuq al al a book of introduction into the discipline of careful investigation on the ways of the Hebrew language. According to the preface of this text, Abu Farad wrote it after the completion of al kitab al-Mushtamil, al al kitab al kafi The work includes a discussion of the terminology that was used by the early Karaite grammarians. These include many of the Hebrew terms that are found in the Dikduk of Ibn Nuh and related early texts, but not used by Abu Farad himself in his own grammatical works. Most of the grammatical works of Abu Farah Sharun are systematically arranged studies of the Hebrew language as an independent discipline. He indeed sometimes goes beyond the description of specifically Hebrew grammar and discusses general principles of human language. In some sections of his works he addresses philosophical issues such as the origin of language and its nature, as we saw early on in Marie Hell's presentation. The perspective of these works, therefore, differs from that of Ibn Nuh's Dikduk, the primary purpose of which was the investigation of scripture by grammatical analysis and the demonstration of the logical structure of the language of scripture. His comprehensive approach to grammar contrasts with Ibn Nuh's practice of concentrating on the problematic issues, the Masail or Nukat. Another divergence from the approach of Ibn Nuh is the categorical approach of Abu Faraj. He rarely presents alternative opinions. Abu Faraj 
refers to the grammarians of early generations, such as Ibn Nuh as al dikdukiyun He did not use the term dikdukiyun to designate all people engaged in the study of grammar. He makes an explicit terminological distinction between the Arabic grammarians and Nuha and the early Karak Hebrew grammarians of Dikdukiyun. Moreover, the way he uses the term of Dikdukiyun in his writings implies that they were a set of scholars is distinct from himself and that, and that he did not regard himself as one of their number. There was, nevertheless, a certain degree of continuity of grammatical thought from the teachings of the Dikdukiyun in the works of Abu Faraj. He was indeed the student of Ibn Nuh and took over some elements of his master's teaching into the edifice of his own work. This relationship between master and student is reflected in the exegetical commentary of Ibn Nuh on the Pentateuch, which was adapted by Abu Faraj, as shown by Miriam Goldstein. In this adaptation, the original text of Ibn Nuh is interwoven with the elaborations, clarifications, and sometimes criticisms of the student. The primary purpose of Abul Faraj in his grammatical works was the systematic investigation of the language, whereas the main objective of the earlier Karak grammarians, as Ibn Nur, was the elucidation of the problematic grammatical details of scripture. As we have seen, attempts were made already by certain circles of Karak grammarians before the time of Abul Faraj to systematize grammatical knowledge. This consisted mainly in the classification of verbs and nouns according to their patterns and inflections. These treatises, however, lack the scope of the grammatical works of Abul Faraj. Abul Faraj follows closely the approach to grammar that had been adopted by most Arabic grammarians of his time. This was the approach of the so-called Bosran school of Arabic grammarians, which had, been the mainstream, which had become the mainstream tradition by the 10th century. The dependence of Abul Faraj on the Bosran tradition is seen in the scope of his works, in his grammatical theory and in his Arabic technical terminology. Much of the terminology of the earlier Karak tradition, by contrast, was Hebrew. One example of this relating to grammatical theory, one example relating to his grammatical theory, is his claim that, is Abul Faraj's claim that the derivational base of verbs as the infinitive rather than the imperative, as we saw from Aharon's uh, presentation. This, uh, as we've seen, uh, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, the, the derivation of verbs from the imperative was a central feature of the earlier Karak grammatical theory. Unlike Ibn Nuh's work, it is clear that Abul Faraj's work draws on written sources belonging to the Arabic grammatical tradition, and indeed his sources can be identified. It is difficult to trace the grammatical thought of Ibn Nuh for, and, and the, to its origin. And the early Karak gram, uh, grammarians, it's difficult to trace the origin of these to any particular written source that is extant. Rather, the format of these early Karak grammatical texts, particularly those of Ibn Nuh, appear to be records of discussions that were originally conducted orally within a schoolroom. One is reminded of the conclusions of Gregor Schoeller in his research of the transmission of Islamic thought in the early Islamic period, that the sources of works in the Islamic religious sciences of the 8th to 10th centuries were lessons given by teachers on the basis of written notes which were read or recited for students who took their own notes. The written form of these texts are redactions based on notebooks associated with such lecture activity. Ibn Nuh's Dikduk is indeed presented in the form of notes. It focuses on Masail rather than presenting systematic descriptions. It discusses alternative opinions. Furthermore, some of the later Karite texts that are clearly pedagogical in nature, as we shall hear from, from Nadja's presentation shortly, um, many of these, the, these more pedagogical texts have many of their roots in the tradition reflected by uh, the works of the early grammarians such as Ibn Nuh. The works of Abul Faraj, by contrast, have the hallmarks of literary compositions. They are systematically arranged with a clear authorial voice. They are self-contained and not dependent or complementary to oral teaching. They were clearly directly dependent on identifiable written sources and reproduced these virtually verbatim in some cases, the major source being 
Kitab al Usul fi Nahu of, uh, uh, of uh, the grammarian As Saraj. The context of this activity is likely to have been the Karaite Dalil Ilm, which was the focus of Karaite intellectual activity in the 11th century. Colophons of works. Um, refer to books being dedicated to the college, which indicates that it contained a library as well as being a meeting place for scholars. This shift to more direct dependence on written Arabic sources no doubt was one of the drivers that brought the Karaite grammatical tradition more into line with mainstream Arabic grammatical thought, away from the penumbra of the activities of the Masoretes. It is important to note, however, that Abul Faraj's comprehensive work on grammar, al kitab al-Mushtamil, and its short version, al kitab al-Kafi, are concerned principally with morphology and syntax. They do not contain treatments of the Masoretic reading tradition. Abul Faraj composed a separate work on biblical reading called Hidayat al-Qari, the guide for the reader, which has been preserved in a long and very shorter versions. It presents a description of the pronunciation of the consonants and vowels in the Tiberian reading tradition, as well as, the, as well as the system of accents. This dichotomy between grammar, that is morphology and syntax, and biblical reading in the works of Abul Faraj can be regarded as a feature of continuity from the earlier Karaite tradition. One should contrast this again with the grammatical work of Sa'adi Ga'on, Kitab for Sikh Lughat al Ibraniyin which, as we have seen, contains extensive treatment of various features of the Masoretic reading tradition, the source of which was, men, was the Masoretic treatises. Finally, it should be noted that the rapprochement of the Karak grammatical tradition with the mainstream tradition of Arabic gram grammar, as reflected in the works of Abul Faraj Harun, did not mark the end of the transmission of the Diktu of Ibn Nuh. There is evidence that the Dikduk continued to be transmitted at a later period, and what is more, it underwent later redactions. A number of manuscripts contain shortened versions of the Dikduk. One manuscript uh, was written in Tinnis in Egypt, which was almost certainly copied after the destruction of the Karaite Centre of Scholarship in Jerusalem by Crusaders in 1099. After the, 10th, after the 11th century, um, Egypt, uh, together with Byzantium, became one of the centres of Karaite scholarship. These texts show that the Dikdu continued to, to be studied, at least in a shortened form, after the 11th century. These shortened versions are redactions of the long Dikdu as a written text. They are, um, and they were apparently not the result of oral schoolroom lectures, which, as we have seen, was the background of the original text. So a, a comparison of the shorter text to parallel passages in the original Dikduk shows various redactional strategies, which include the reduction of examples, the elimination of alternative opinions, and, most interestingly, the updating of technical terminology and the reformulation of grammatical description in conformity with the standard Arabic grammatical tradition. Such careful reworking of the Dikduk is the result of close study of its contents. The updating of terminology and reformulation indicate that it was more than of antiquarian interest and was regarded as a valuable source for grammatical study at a later period. The fact that one of the short versions of the, of the Dikduk is appended to a biblical commentary suggests that it was actively used in <coughs> Karaic exegetical study at that period. To conclude, the Karaite tradition of Hebrew grammar appears to have emerged in Iran and joined forces with the Masoretic tradition of Bible scholarship in Tiberias. It was complementary to the Masoretic tradition, unlike the grammatical work of Sa'adia, which was independent, which was in, which itself, Sa'adia's work, was independent of the Masoretic tradition. The major text that has come down to us, the Dikduk of Ibn Nuh, although written in Arabic, was not um, was cl was clearly uh, not dependent on any specific text in the Arabic grammatical tradition, but rather appears to be notes of orally delivered lectures. Some parallel extant texts indeed are written in Persian, and at a later period, we've just seen the Dikduk was transmitted 
as a written text and underwent literary redaction. Um, and just in two minutes, I'll just say, just to um, talk about perhaps the future of, uh, as I see it, of this, the study of um, Karaite grammatical tradition. Uh, I, I, I think, I mean, we have now, there are a number of texts now that have been published, and uh, as I really am giving you a sort of a, a, a sort of a this survey of the state of the art, uh, excluding what uh, Nadia is going to say in a minute, which is going to complement this presentation. Um, but we, sti we clearly still have, there's a lot of work to be done on extant texts. I mean, we, there are still a number of extant texts that need to be edited. And uh, I have to say, perhaps now getting a little bit, um, speaking autobiographically, that, you know, uh, um, you know, you know, many of us in this room have, have devoted many hours of many hours of work into editing texts, and it is we all know what a laborious activity it is. Uh, but it really is the only way to make progress uh, in the field, uh, and this is for not only because it makes the texts extant for others for, for other scholars to work on, but also because it is only through a careful critical edition, in my opinion and its translation that you really can penetrate some of the complicated ideas that appear in these texts. Um, now, as for the sort of texts which still remain to be edited, I mean, there are a number of texts from all of these, uh, uh, the, from both the early period, the time of Ibn Nuh, and also from Abu Faraj, there's still a number of texts of Abu Faraj that are not published, um, and also there's some... Um, tantalizing reference uh, I heard from a Chagha ben Shammai of uh, some text uh, discovered in this uh, latest um, so-called uh, Afghan Geniza, which, uh, uh, which has been in the news recently, which apparently contains one, early, one text of, some grammat of a grammatical nature, seems to be some sort of grammatical commentary, in Hebrew, entirely written in Hebrew, with uh, Babylonian vocalization. Um, which would sort of suggest that, um, uh, possibly, possibly confirm that you know the, the, the hypothesis that really the very first Karaite grammarians were writing in Hebrew. So, thank you. Comments, questions? All right. I have a few questions, many of uh, clarification. The first one is. Uh, regards the genre of this uh, grammatical exegesis, mm. as we find about the same in the same period in Spain, uh, a huge writing in the same genre is grammatical uh, exegesis to uh, the prophets. The prophets is there a way to relate uh, these two words to each other? Not so much in public, but just in terms of, of, of genre. Do you have any idea how this genre will manage to go? Yeah, I mean, I, as I was saying, I, I think it really was a kind of a on the back of, 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 of the Masoretic activities. I mean, it was not... I mean, for the reasons I was presenting it, it doesn't seem to simply... Well, I think it's fantastic with what Saadi did. I mean, Saadi was kind of... He, he was, he was basically working completely independently. He was um, coming up with sort of an independent grammatical work, which included all kinds of things on, of a Masoretic nature, like uh, Dagesh and Dachik and vowels and, and, vowels and also seems the accents. Whereas the, this, this uh, discipline of Dick Duke seems to have been somehow result of expansion of, of, of development of existing Masoretic activity. I mean, in other words, it was complementing. It was, it was looking at, it was not concerned with uh, just, you know, it, it really didn't get into any details, really, of uh, accents. and had, had nothing, It had nothing to say at all, really, about the accents, except the position of stress. But basically, it was not concerned with, with the accents and pronunciation. Um, so for that reason, I think, you know, I... I think its origin is the certainly, certainly our in the Karaite discipline uh, as, in the as in the work of Ibn Nuh is a sort of a complement, sort of developed out of complementarity with the matter of activity. I mean, I really wouldn't know. I mean, you, you, you might offer opinions of your own about the background of the Ketebul Nutta. I mean, why 
how that emerged in Spain. I mean, whether this was re he was regarding this as being somehow complementary to him. So, I mean, they were just this, they were sort of separated from the matter activity. They were very cut off. I mean, they didn't in Spain. Ibn Jannah said he couldn't have any, didn't have any access directly to Tiberian teachers, and uh, I um, I really don't know quite what the genesis was of the of, of the table, but, uh, it's, it's, it's more difficult to explain. It's, uh, it, um, it's much easier to explain, I think, the, the, the background of the Karaite discipline. Mm. So, so I'm not sure whether you disagree with Dotan or you support Dotan's mm. view <coughs> regarding the emergence of the, the Dikduk in general, not just the Karaite. But he says that even the Rabbinite uh, Dikduk emerged out of the Masora. The yeah. So, do you support that? Well, I think the critical and crucial point is that you can't simply use the term dikduk. It's good that you're speaking. We speak Hebrew. It's confident. It's difficult because modern Hebrew dikduk means just grammar. Yeah, 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 grammar. But my claim is that the early period dikduk didn't mean quite what we yeah, mean today. Course, yeah. I mean, it did not mean a systematic grammatical description. It was Abu Faraj is, is the beginning of the systematic grammatical thing. Or Sadia in some yeah. respects. So, I mean, it's, it's probably true that Sadia was the first grammarian in the sort of sense of grammar as we know it. But my claim is that these early grammarians were largely, con they, they were involved in a slightly different discipline, which was more like a complementary discipline. It wasn't sort of almost a freestanding discipline. It was, a, it was a sort of part of Bible study, which involved grammatical, some grammatical thought and grammatical theory. So, and some of the elements of the, I mean, the grammatical theoretical elements of this can be traced back. Indeed, there are a few concepts, you know, you can go back all the way to rabbinic literature, like, you know, Rabin and Yachid and things like that. And, um, uh, but, um, you know, so the grammatic, I mean, I suppose the, the, the short answer would be that they, we, there are certainly grammatical concepts which you can trace back a long way, some possibly even rabbinic period. But, you know, the, the, these, in the sort of the 10th century, let's say, the Karaites, this all fed into a discipline of grammatical Bible study. And then it was only in the 11th century we got Karaite grammatic grammar as a discipline. So I think it's important to make that distinction. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's, so the, the, you know, the answer to who was the first grammarian or, you know, what's the origin, the, the dawn of Arabic gra uh, Hebrew grammar, it's just not as simple as that. It's not a sort of big bang that suddenly the discipline of Hebrew grammar began, I think. We have talked about this before, but I, I wonder if you have any new idea about why didn't the Karaite grammarians adopt the theory of the uh, three-literal uh, word? Well, um, since they were in close contact with, uh, they were in the Arab or Islamic milieu. What, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, the actual fact is, you know, the Ibn Nuh does have a concept of of um, an, an abstract, I mean, I didn't go into it here, but I mean, his, his, his main derivation of morphology is, is, is that, that, that he derived, in the process of derivation, the, bait, the actual starting point of the derivation is a, a, a morphological form, the imperative, which is a real form. Mm -hmm. But he does also have a concept of an abstract root, uh, which he calls the jauhab, you know, the sort of the essence of, of the word, which uh, can contain certain weak elements. I mean, uh, particularly uh, middle weak elements, uh, like the vab in kam yakum, he would say the jalpar is kof wal vab mem, for example. Though he doesn't actually, he doesn't adopt the sort of the rigid sort of theory of triliterality. I think, I think, um, Probably the you know the answer would be that certainly Benuch could understand that in that as I was saying I don't really think I think a lot of the kind of teaching of, of the early school was not really not flowing directly out of contact with Arabic uh, grammatical thought there are a few terms that that uh, 
uh, clearly attributable to the agrographical fault. But you know, it's not. There's so much. You know, there's, there's lots in that dictu which is simply cannot find traces of in the Arabic grammatical theory, including the whole system of derivation and imperative. So probably that's that's more understandable. Why Al Bufaraj didn't adopt it? Um, it's uh, it may be because. Although I'm saying it was a major break with the previous period, it, it was still. I suppose this is where you know he perhaps he was under the influence of his teacher to some extent. That he was perhaps continuing. This, there was a sort of a vest. There was a vestige of the earlier system of of of, of, verb, of, of verb morphology, which possibly might have been there. Because you know, I mean, I think Pam Nadi is going to talk about this in a minute about other sort of systems of class verbal classification which had its roots in a previous... Now you're saying she's not. Oh, right. Well, never mind. <laughs> I, if I may, sure. I really support Geoffrey's idea that um, mm -hmm. verbal derivation is very much a matter of tradition. It is the main point of Karait grammar, if you look at it, is a whole school and tradition, verbal derivation. And in this particular area of grammar, uh, Abul Faraj wasn't very original and creative. And you can see it even in his use of terminology, whereas in other parts of grammar he uses Arabic terminology. Mm -hmm. in, this, in these chapters on verbal derivation, suddenly you find Hebrew terminology showing you that he is borrowing from the early tradition. And it's not the most uh, creative part of his work and maybe not the area he's most interested in. So he just takes it over for the sake of completeness. And it's so surprising that uh, such an Arabized, uh, I mean, as you said uh, the other day that he was reading, uh, he was reading contrary to uh, even more, that he was so familiar with Arabic uh, grammatical literature and uh, exegetical literature. And uh, when he comes to that, he's completely He's again back to his own roots of current. Uh, yes. But look, Arabic grammarians weren't that interested in verbal morphology either. This was simple matter for them. You don't find uh, verbal morphology being the central matter of their books. So this was an area where it was more difficult to draw an Arabic grammar. <laughs> if you read Sibu Way, it's all about syntax. But yeah, um, well, uh, what you, that you said, I have another explanation, and not, uh, I, I don't know if I'm right or not, or not. It seems to me that uh, there is a um, principal uh, difference bet between two approaches. I, mean, uh, I see Ibn Nur as a forerunner of uh, some modern trends in linguistics rather than a structuralist approach to. Uh, present the whole system, systematic approach to grammar, and it uh, seems that uh, he was a scholar who rather uh, mm, uh, re asked questions uh, upon some difficult, difficult uh, um, points uh, of, of the text, and I would uh, compare him to some trends as uh, perhaps text linguistics or <laughs> discourse right. analysis. Right. He is a great forerunner of some well, other <laughs> trends, whereas yeah. uh, Abu uh, Faraj uh, is rather in, uh, uh, some in the frames of, of structuralist uh, approach to grammar. Mm. I mean, it's very interesting you say that because I, when I first read it, before, this is was my this is why I got so excited about the text because really what you see is that when we get into the Abu Faraj sort of type tradition, which is more the sort of systematic, yeah. comprehensive grammar. We're in a sort of tradition of grammars we as as was was known down to really which remained with us down to the days of text linguistics in the twentieth century. And it's um, some of the issues. You know, I mean, even though you know, since he was concerned about ex exegesis, prime, you know, he sort of had this sort of dimension beyond the discipline of grammar, but he wanted to actually focus on understanding um, sort of the language also from an exegetical point of view. Um, 
this did motivate him to look at connections between uh, um, sentences, but particularly with regard to this issue of pausal forms, which is connected over this. So this is a grammatical sort of element in these, um, this sort of issue. And in fact, you know, many of the, the sort of statements he makes are very reminiscent of some of the statements of the, of the text linguistics in the 20th century, when people are talking about relations between clauses. Yeah. And, it's, and it's very interesting how in biblical studies, it's, you know, text linguistics have really blossomed in the last few decades in biblical studies by people primarily interested in exegesis, whereas they have not really developed at all in, in other Semitic languages like Arabic, or I don't know, Aramaic or Akkadian or whatever. There's not really that so much interest in text linguistics, but in biblical studies there, it's developed an interest because, you know, people are interested in the, in the actual use of language to, to explain the text. And this is precisely what Ibn Nuf was doing a thousand years ago. So, so we've gone full circle. Yeah. And uh, so, um, yes. I but, see some yeah. common notes in uh, such approaches to text as, uh, for example, one comma or a label or a uh, lake of sorry or Vizbizka uh, who just raise questions and solve particular questions and don't form the whole system of, of right. grammar. Whereas uh, traditional grammar uh, is rather concerned with uh, uh, proposing a whole system which is, um, as they say, uh, representatives of, uh, let's say, uh, cognitive grammar, which is incomplete. It must be uh, <laughs> right. new components such as uh, metaphor or semantics and, and so on. Perhaps it goes too far, but uh, nevertheless, so I see the main difference in, in approach. Another question I would like to, to say I appreciate how much work you have done, but uh, um, as well. Uh, if I properly understood, uh, understood, so you haven't retrieved the whole work of uh, Ibn Bukh? Um, well, they can retrieve mo well, most of them, the actual work on the Tuvim, <laughs> on the Nuvim, the, the, the writings of the prophets, is basically we've got the full text essentially um, in its original version. The Pentateuch, uh, it really is only surviving fragments, and uh -huh. a lot of those are shortened versions. Interesting, I don't know whether there's any significance in that. Um, but there are fragments of uh, other rela other texts relating to the early tradition. I mean, Nadia's works on some of these. Uh, you've discovered uh, some fragments in the Ganes as well, oh. relating, she'll tell you about her discoveries shortly. Uh, one uh, methodolog methodological restriction is uh, uh, linked to this question uh, until we don't know the whole output of uh, Ibn Nuh, we may now not draw any fi final conclusion that uh, uh, somebody else who followed him <coughs> doesn't rely on it because yeah. we don't know the whole of his output, perhaps yeah. it's not the case. Yeah, I mean, the point I'm, I made is that I recently did a um, comparison of Ibn Nuh and Yefet and mm -hmm. a couple of other commentators, basically, on Hosea. And it's interesting how the uh, Yefet, for example, he has lists of, um, he has some grammatical comments in his commentary. But uh, probably about 50%, possibly 60, 70%, I'm not sure, you can find you know, parallels in Ibn Nuh. But 30% you can't, showing that Yefet, I don't know where Yefet got his grammatical knowledge from, but he was clearly, Ibn Nuh was certainly not, he was just the tip of the iceberg, I think, of, of, of the grammatical sort of teachings which were going on in the, in the Karaite schools in the, in the 10th century. And some of this filtered into the exegetical texts without appearing in his dikduk. Because we don't say we don't really know what the background of the dikduk was. I mean, my current thinking is it was not simply a, it, it wasn't a literary text. It wasn't something that, you know, even Luke didn't sit down one day and write, write the whole book. And it was, uh, he was really 
it is reflecting all the classroom teaching, and this is how, as Gregor Schurler said, this is what happened in the early slave period. And these may have even been simply student notes. I mean, who knows? They might have been the notes of students, not necessarily even the author. I mean, we don't know. Uh, in which case, we might not have the full story for that reason. I mean, you know, students don't take full notes. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to make one comment that, that I learned from my teacher, Professor Nachum Sarna, Zichron Oli who argued that the fact that both the Karaites and the Rabbinites were willing to accept the, the Masoretic text and work was the fact that even though it only appeared in the 9th century, it really was much more ancient and, the, uh, and therefore predated the split between the, uh, the groups. Now, this is part of his conservative... Uh, nature and his attitude toward the text and the tradition, but uh, it, it would, if the Masoretes did bridge the, the gap between the two groups, uh, there might be something to this, this theory also. Yeah, I mean, I think this idea that there's a lot of wasted energies, there's been a lot of wasted energy trying to sort of argue whether the Masoretes are Karaites or Rabbanites. I mean, I, I, my feeling now is very much that there was an issue that what happened was simply joining the forces. You know, this happened a lot in the early early days of charism. We talk about you know when the Ananites and Karaites came together and all kinds of things like that. I mean, and I think this is again a question of joining of forces, and it's you can't uh, we can't necessarily brand them as any particular na name. You know, have any sort of relating to any kind of religious or halachic sort of. You keep on advertising Nadja, but their people don't want to hear it. No. <laughs> Just very quickly. Okay. No, maybe quickly I try. Yeah. Okay. I would like to refer to one segment of your uh, discussion about the identification of Baalei Mikra and Karaim. Firstly, I'm not sure I have doubt about that, uh, the identification of Baalei Mikra in the Talmudic sources as uh, the Karaim. I didn't say they were Karaim. No, you said that they are Mikra, this is people that are dealing with the Mikra and they are people that are dealing with the Mishnah and the Talmud. Right, but that doesn't make them Karaim. Okay, so I'm mistaken. <coughs> About That's the a, whole point. Actually, it's a crucially important point. So the, what they are, what they they are, are simply circles of scholars <laughs> within, let's call it Rabbinite Judaism, which uh, we're fo focusing on, on the Bible. On the Bible, okay. Not Karaites. as far as I know, al is the one that you have in, in the sources that is referred to the Karaim. Yes? And this, in his epistle, is attacking Baalei Mikra. And he gives three issues, halachic issues, against Baalei Mikra, and he identifies himself as a Karaite. Uh, even if you read Salmon bin Yerucha, the known um, commentary to Psalm 69.1, he will, st he will tell you about Anan, that was the, the first that uh, bring people to leave the, the Bible. And in the end, he will tell you who are the Karaites. It has nothing to do with the Balei Mikra. It has messianic, a ex explanation and, and interpretation. And in my book, I want I showed a lot of quotation from Karaites, trying to tell who are people are that Korim uh, and what has the, what is the meaning of Karaites, and you don't find this uh, this um, interpretation of the word as you uh, put it, and. In the end, I would say that um, Abu Faraj Arun would have, wouldn't be in ease compare the Dikdukuin with, with the people of the Masora. Because if you read Idayat al Kari, he has a problem who, from what source comes the Masora. And he would uh, uh, say explicitly that it comes from the prophets, and I'm not going to elaborate why. Why he said it? Everybody knows. And the, the, the queen is other other thing. This is the way of thinking. And Balaam Masuba is 
the, the ideology problem of identifying them as, pe as people that brought their knowledge from the prophets. Otherwise, I say, otherwise, if the Torah was brought by Torah Shabbat Alpeh, so there is no Karaism. So all kind of this uh, point that I made, uh, I have doubt about this identification that we have. Uh, well, <coughs> well, first of all, I mean, it's I mean, the variety of points there. I mean, first of all, the issue of the Hidayat al Qari, I mean, the, I mean, basically, what Abul Faraj is saying in there, if you look carefully at the text, is that he's, he's talking about um, teachers of the reading tradition. Um, what he's concerned about is the actual reading. And uh, the, the, the sources of the reading is, is the teachers associated with the teachers of Tiberius. So um, I, mean, I think that shows us, you know, there's a very, very close relationship with the teachers of Tiberius, who were clearly referring to Masoretic circles. Um, and, um, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can deal with all these, the details about al um about what he was criticizing the Bali Masora as... Bali Mikra. Bali Mikra, right. Um, um, I mean, it's... Uh, all I can say is that the, the circles of the text, the, 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 the scholarly circles from which the text I've been talking about, the, the Dik Duk, basically, come from, this term <coughs> Bali Mikra is very much associated with that circle. I mean, and, and we know that Ibn Nuh was one of this circle, and we know that Ibn Nuh was, I mean, we know he's a Karaite from a variety of sources, I mean, that's uncontroversial. Um, I mean, I, I would have to look at the, you know, the text of what see is quite what it's all about, but I mean, it, it could well be here we're dealing simply with um, various um, layers of, 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 of um, Different sort of uh, diversity of opinions in, you know, in in in, uh, in thought. I mean, this is, I think, this is one of the problems relating specifically to the relationship of the of the Karite grammarians to the Masoretes. Is in fact they are rather these grammarians are of a rather different nature from people and scholars concerned with issues such as the calendar and things like that. I mean, it's it's almost as if they are. It's difficult to sort of draw the boundaries in such a clear way. I mean, this, I think this has been part of the problem with... I mean, I, I myself, I'm not an expert on the origins of historical origins of charism, but I mean, from my little sort of corner of, of grammar, I mean, I, I see that it's much easier to sort of think of, not to sort of draw clear boundaries uh, according to any religious persuasion or halakhic persuasion, it's more Almost it's, uh, we're dealing here with an issue of people sharing a discipline. It's almost like Bale Mikra is uh, referring to a disciplinary sort of coverage rather than anything to do with halakha. And uh, so I think that's a, an issue one has to take to account, that, um, which might answer, go somewhere towards answering the fundamental questions which Danny is trying to persuade us to engage with, and specifically, what is Karaite about Karaite grammar? And we go back to that first question. And I was saying that, uh, you know, uh, well, we possibly haven't got time to get to rehearse all that, but I think it just, just make the point that sometimes we should look at discipline rather than halachic sort of div disciplinary divisions rather than halachic divisions. And, I think that, that sometimes is of a significant. Yeah. Uh, continuing with what you were saying, Danny, also. Uh, Jeff, we were talking about the, uh, the, the theoretical uh, cooperation amongst Rabbinites and Karaites in our Sirenic, uh, activities in Tiberias or elsewhere. It uh, reminded me very much of the background which is behind the uh, work which I described, uh, where it seems that there was some sort of atmosphere of accommodation and cooperation, and there was a crisis, and it, it blew up, so to speak, and uh, that's what generated the, that clinical work. But 
there was in the background there seems to have been this type of uh, mm -hmm. cooperation or some sort of interaction in a positive way between Carrots and Rabbinites, which may have been uh, you know, this uh, master activity that you described. Mm -hmm. The question is when do they stop eating in each other's houses? I mean, if you have a dis different discipline, or you're an historian and you're a grammarian, you can, you can socialize. But if you eat meat and milk and you don't eat meat and milk, it's a more difficult. Well, you just be well, before Maimonides, you have to remember that they intermarried and they prayed in each other's synagogues. Yeah, no, no. I, 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 I according just, to Geniza, we know that they prayed in each other's synagogues. Yeah. And uh, so why not uh, sit was, down and vocalize <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering what, what, what will happen in Ranein when they start, the two synagogues start having competitions as to where the people go. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, there's a bit of kiddush.